on World News Tonight. Revenge strikes. Ukraine sees a devastation of grain ports by Russian counter-offensive efforts. Mass deaths. Over a dozen people faced an unfortunate demise in India after an unexpected explosion. On the brink, a US soldier crossing over the North Korean boundary causes a diplomatic uproar as tensions with South Korea intensify with missile threats. And pooch power. Puppies in Brazil say goodbye to empty tummies as one dog makes it their mission to feed its friends. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are watching World News. We start off tonight in Ukraine as Russia sought revenge over the Crimean bridge attack, striking a fuel storage in Odessa and a plant, making seaborne drones as part of a mass revenge strikes for attacks by Ukraine that knocked out its road bridge to the occupied Crimea. This came a day after Russia pulled out of a UN-backed grain deal. Ukrainian authorities released body cam video they say shows the aftermath of a Russian missile attack on Odessa, one of Ukraine's main ports for exporting grain, a day after Russia pulled out of a UN-backed deal that let Kyiv safely ship its agricultural products to global markets. Several homes were damaged by Russian strikes Tuesday, as well as unspecified port infrastructure in Odessa. That's according to Ukrainian officials who also describe a serious fire at a port in Mykolaiv. Ukraine's Air Force said six caliber cruise missiles and 31 out of 36 drones had been shot down, mostly over the coastal Odessa and Mykolaiv regions in the south. The Russian Defense Ministry said it hit fuel storage in Odessa, where the Ukrainian Navy has its headquarters, and a seaborne drone factory as part of mass revenge strikes in retaliation for Monday's attack on a key bridge linking Russia to Russian-occupied Crimea. Ukraine denied involvement in the bridge attack. Shortly after the bridge was hit on Monday, Moscow withdrew from the grain export deal, a move the United Nations said risked creating mass hunger. If Ukrainian grain is blocked from the market, prices could soar around the world, hitting the poorest countries hardest. Speaking at the Odessa port on Tuesday, chief of the U.S. Agency for International Development, Samantha Power, announced $250 million in new funding for Ukraine's embattled farmers. We will work to create and to expand alternative export routes for Ukrainian farmers. Moscow rejected calls from Ukraine to allow shipping to resume without Russian participation, with the Kremlin openly saying ships entering the area without its guarantees would be in danger. Now over in India, 15 people have died after an electricity transformer exploded on the banks of the Alakanda River in the north Indian state of Uttarakhand. Authorities say a police official and five home guards are among those killed in the accident which took place in the Chamoli district. The state's chief minister Pushkar Singh Dami has ordered an inquiry into the incident. Police say at least 15 people have also been severely injured in the accident. They are being treated at the district's main hospital. Chamoli's superintendent of police, Pramendra Dobal, said the incident took place last night but was reported to them this morning. According to media reports, the transformer exploded and electrified a bridge which spans the river. Mr. Dobal said the authorities got a call from the village that a watchman had died of electrocution and when the police went to check, it was found that 21 other people have also been electrocuted and severely injured. 15 people died in hospital and the rest are in critical condition. Explosion, fire, smoke destroyed Australian military trucks and burnt out a U.S. Army tank as multiple explosions occurred in a major Queensland highway following a multi-vehicular crash. It looks like a bomb has gone off. The fire and intense black smoke making way for this. A burnt out mess. Cars, caravans, trucks and another vehicle rarely seen in traffic crashes. This is a US Army tank, its dark exterior camouflaged in the charred ruins of the semi-trailer that was transporting it on the Bruce Highway. Seven vehicles crashed near Bejewel outside of Rockhampton 
at lunchtime and this was the result. Black smoke pouring from two trucks and a car, which caught fire instantly. Loud explosions then heard by witnesses. Um, and as I was talking to the emergency people, uh, there were at least four or five explosions had been going off and they thought at the time it might have been the gas bottles in the caravan. The US Abrams tank was carrying several hundred litres of fuel, so police immediately declared an exclusion zone kilometres wide to be sure nothing on board would explode. The blaze spreading to nearby grassland, shutting down a section of the rail network. It has been quite a difficult fire to combat today. Due to the location, we are hampered with a lack of water. As well as fire crews, military police raced to the scene to investigate along with ambulance officers to transport six people injured. These aerial images from the Nine News helicopter making clear how incredible it is. No one lost their life. The caravan was ripped off the car. There was a, another car on the other side of the road. There was a Prado there that looked like a beach ball. The scene is spread out over a, a significant distance and it is quite remarkable that people have survived this impact and fire today. Just yesterday, the US Army posted these images to social media. Tanks and an Apache helicopter unloaded off ships at the port of Gladstone in preparation for Talisman Sabre War Games. It's believed the tank was being taken to Shoalwater Bay, where Americans will join our troops for training exercises this weekend. Obviously, our thoughts are very much with uh, those who have been injured and, and their families, and where Defence can assist in this, it will. Unrest continues to surge in Israel as reports indicate that at least 45 people have been arrested in the mass protests in Israel. The demonstrations are in response to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plans to limit judicial power. Mass protests paralyzing much of Israel as the country's rolling political crisis appears to be coming to a head. Demonstrators swarming onto platforms at major train stations, while these military veterans chain themselves together in front of the defense ministry. At least 45 people arrested, police using water cannon to clear crowds from a major highway. All of it in protest against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plans to weaken Israel's Supreme Court. And after six months of stops and starts, Netanyahu now looks ready to ram the first part of his legislation through Parliament as early as this weekend. These protesters outside the U.S. Embassy, hoping that a last-minute American intervention might force their government to back down. But while President Biden has repeatedly expressed concern about Netanyahu's plan, he said nothing publicly today during a meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog. And some protesters frustrated that Biden this week extended an invitation to Netanyahu to visit the U.S. Netanyahu says the legislation will curb activist judges, starting with this week's bill, which strips the Supreme Court of the power to rule government actions unreasonable. The court used that clause to stop Netanyahu appointing a man convicted of tax fraud to a senior cabinet post. Tonight, growing numbers of reservist Air Force pilots say they'll refuse to show up for duty if the government pushes ahead. And protesters vowing to fight on even if the bill goes through, leaving Israel a nation deeply divided against itself. More legal troubles for former U.S. President Donald Trump as he has revealed on social media that he has received a letter from prosecutors suggesting that he is likely to be criminally indicted over the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol. Donald Trump on Tuesday could soon face even greater legal jeopardy, this time from a federal investigation into events leading up to and including the deadly storming of the U.S. Capitol by his supporters on January 6, 2021. Posting on his Truth Social site, the former president said he'd received a letter informing him he was a target of a grand jury investigating the January 6th attack. Trump said the letter came from the office of special counsel Jack Smith, who was appointed last year to oversee federal investigations into the 45th president, who was once again seeking the White House. Trump's attorneys could not immediately be reached for comment. A spokesperson for Smith's office declined to comment. Peter Zeidenberg, a former federal prosecutor, said receiving a target letter means the individual should, quote, presume that you're going to get indicted unless you give a damn good reason why we shouldn't. Former officials who appeared before a special congressional committee probing the January 6th riot 
told lawmakers Trump pressed unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud after he lost the 2020 presidential election. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats. He used similar language at a rally on January 6th, just before his supporters stormed Congress in an effort to stop the certification of the election results. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Trump supporters used weapons, including chemical sprays and riot shields, to attack police and break into the building, forcing lawmakers who were in the process of certifying the results of the 2020 election to flee for their lives. More than 1,000 people have been charged with crimes connected with the riot, including some who have been convicted of seditious conspiracy. If Trump is indicted in connection with January 6th, it would be the second prosecution Smith is pursuing against the former president. On Tuesday, Trump's attorneys appeared in a Miami federal court for a hearing related to accusations he illegally retained national security documents after leaving office and lied to investigators trying to retrieve them. Agents who searched his Mar-a-Lago, Florida residence found some of those documents in boxes in a bathroom and a closet. Trump is the first former president to ever have been indicted. He also faces New York state criminal charges, accusing him of falsifying business records to hide a hush money payment to an adult film star. And more indictments could come. On Monday, the Georgia Supreme Court rejected a bid by Trump to block a state investigation into whether he and his allies illegally attempted to meddle with Georgia's 2020 election. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Heat waves continue to scorch the globe as the city of Phoenix, Arizona has broken a heat record from almost 50 years ago when temperatures reached above 110 degrees Fahrenheit for the 19th straight day, which one man said felt like opening an oven. Temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit might not be the ideal conditions for a hike, but Amit Bagoji and his friend are still out on the trails near Phoenix, Arizona anyway. They're among the few braving heat that broke records on Tuesday, and it sounds like they won't be doing so for long. It's like you open an oven door and it's the heat wave. Like when you open like an oven, that's what it feels like, exactly what it feels like. People have been sweltering in the city's scorching heat since June the 30th. In recorded history, Phoenix hasn't seen this many days in a row of temperatures above 110 degrees. The last time it came close was 1974, almost 50 years ago. In case some were unaware, billboards across the city advertised the soaring temperatures. Those were 112 degrees at just after 1 p.m. local time, but soared as high as 118 hours later, according to the National Weather Service. Tom Frieders is the warning coordination meteorologist at the services office in Phoenix. He says there's no indication of the record heat abating anytime soon. The forecast continues to, to call for temperatures from 115 to 120, continuing to expand across the region through the end of the week and possibly into the weekend. So uh, we're, we're in this for uh, quite a while yet. And again, it's that prolonged heat that becomes more serious. The Arizona Public Service said in a release on Monday that electricity demand has soared to an all-time peak for a second week in a row, thanks to demand from air conditioners. It mirrors similar trends in Texas and elsewhere, as a massive heat dome parked over the southern and western United States keeps large numbers of Americans under extreme heat advisories. It is pretty expansive and uh uh, abnormally strong for, for even this time of year. And so uh, the impacts are being felt by, by millions and millions of people across the country. The record-breaking heat is just one part of the unusual weather being experienced across the U.S. Air quality is poor in many areas, including Rapid City in South Dakota, as smoke from Canadian wildfires wafts across the border. A tropical storm is also hitting Hawaii. Scientists say such extreme weather events are likely to become more commonplace. Now, for the first time in decades, a U.S. soldier is believed to be in North Korean custody. That is a scenario that could cause a diplomatic headache for the United States. While it, alongside ally South Korea, tries to keep pressure on Pyongyang as the isolated nation ramps up its ballistic missile tests and bellicose rhetoric. 
U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Tuesday confirmed that an active U.S. service member had crossed a demarcation line over to North Korea without authorization. Yeah, what I can confirm, and uh, I would say up front that we're very early uh, in this uh, event, and so there's a lot uh, that, uh, that we're still trying to learn. But what we do know is that one of our service members who was on a tour uh, willfully and without authorization cross the military demarcation line. Austin said the soldier, Private Travis King, is believed to be in North Korean custody and his well-being is still being investigated. According to the U.S. State Department, the Pentagon has reached out to its North Korean counterparts for information. The confirmation comes as United Nations Command in Korea said earlier that a U.S. citizen crossed the military demarcation line while on a group tour to the Joint Security Area in the demilitarized zone. According to a U.S. Army spokesperson, Private King joined the military back in January 2021 and was in Korea as part of the 1st Armored Division. Army and defense officials say King was facing disciplinary action and was said to be administratively separated from the U.S. Army. According to the AP, King had served nearly two months in a South Korean prison for assault and was released on July 10th. He was being sent home to Fort Bliss, Texas on Monday. However, after being escorted to the airport, he failed to board his flight and instead left the airport. He then joined a tour of the border village of Pamunjam before crossing over to the north. Such instances of defection are rare, but King now becomes the seventh American soldier to have crossed over to North Korea willingly. Larry Abshir and James Dresnock are two well-known cases of U.S. service members who defected to North Korea, having done so in 1962. Meanwhile, there is a fresh defiance by North Korea as the country fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea following their previous launch of the intercontinental ballistic missile. North Korea launched two short-range ballistic missiles, or SRBMs, toward the East Sea just a week after it has fired an intercontinental ballistic missile. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff on Wednesday detected the SRBM launch from the Sunan area of Pyongyang between 3.30 a.m. and 3.46 a.m. While further details are still being evaluated, it is known that the missiles traveled about 550 kilometers before landing in the sea. The South Korean military is working closely with the U.S. in order to be fully prepared for any further provocations. The latest launch comes after South Korea and the U.S. held their first nuclear consultative group meeting on Tuesday. The group, which was set up in April during a summit between President Yoon and President Biden, aims for better coordination on an allied nuclear response to North Korean threats. It also follows the arrival of the USS Kentucky, a U.S. nuclear-capable ballistic missile submarine, in South Korea also on Tuesday. After confirming the missile launch, 2nd Deputy National Security Advisor Im Jong-duk held a meeting to review the security situation and receive a briefing from the JCS. The presidential office said that the latest launch is not a matter that needs to be discussed with the National Security Council. Meanwhile, the JCS strongly condemned the North's provocation, saying that it harms peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula as well as internationally and is in clear violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. The U.S. and the Pacific Command was quick to reaffirm its commitment to defense of South Korea and Japan. It also condemned the latest launch, saying that it didn't pose an immediate threat to the U.S. or to its allies, but it shows that the regime is undermining security through its illegal weapons development. Over in the south of Korea now, as it is still reeling from the aftermath of the deadly torrential rain with central and southern regions among the hardest hit. For a swift recovery in those areas, state funds will be on their way to the affected local governments and individuals, with those 13 areas now classified as special disaster zones. President Yoon suk yeol has first-hand declared special disaster zones for 13 areas that have been seriously damaged by the torrential rain. The areas that will receive state support include Yecheongun County in Gyeongsangbuk-do province and Cheongju City in Chungcheongbuk-do province. Both areas suffer greatly from fatal landslides or flooding due to the heavy rain. The government explained that the reason the decision was made before the central investigation had been finalized was based on the judgment that preemptive government action is necessary to quickly repair the damage. A director general at the Ministry of the Interior and Safety told what support is given to the affected regions. 
When a large-scale disaster strikes, local governments can only recover so much with their own budgets. That is why we support them as a central government so they can get back to normal as soon as possible. Up to 80% of the damage recovery costs will be funded by the state in special disaster zones. In addition to state support for local governments, help will be offered for individuals in the affected areas. This includes postponements on tax and discounts on utility bills. The residents will also get a discount on their health insurance fee and phone bill. For the areas that haven't been declared special disaster zones yet, the government said it plans to conduct damage analysis and make additional declarations if necessary. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. King Charles marked 400 years since William Shakespeare's plays were published in collective form, bringing actors and directors together to celebrate his love for the Bard and a book hailed as one of the most important in English literature. Hungary's foreign minister stated that his country is opposed to any weapon deliveries to Ukraine and especially stands against the use of cluster munitions, who further added that solutions must come at the negotiating table and not on the battlefield. Striking actors showed their love for the hit television series Bridgerton at the picket line outside Netflix in Los Angeles, dressing up in 18th century styled outfits. A Panamanian court Sentence former President Ricardo Martinelli to more than 10 years in prison for money laundering, threatening the frontrunner's bid for a new term next year. Japan is set to start releasing more than 1 million tons of treated water from the wrecked Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant this summer after having received approval from the International Atomic Energy Agency. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We leave you tonight in Brazil, where a friendly furry friend sprawls the metropolis Sao Paulo on a motorbike, handing out free dog food to his less fortunate animal friends. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.